Okay, um, welcome everybody. So, um, uh, as we know, the new semester just started, and we hope to uh, uh, give everybody a good show. Many of you are new students, some of you are existing students, uh, and many faculties actually are, are here too. Why? Because we may not actually know what each other are working on. Uh, so we want to learn. Uh, through this opportunity, students and faculty alike, we wish to learn uh, each other's work. Um, and, and the best way, actually, is to have this um, presented at a high level, so people can easily understand, without knowing the details, uh, what professors are working on and what they find uh, as the most exciting. Uh, as part of this, we hope to record all the presentations so that we can uh, post it online uh, as an introduction for professor's work. Now this uh, we find to be a very effective way to learn uh, what other people are working on, especially through programs such as TED, TED. If, if you have watched it, uh, people come up and explain their innovations, their work. Uh, at Davos, uh, people present also in uh, 15 minutes uh, of their most exciting lifelong work. Uh, so here, we give faculty only five minutes, and this is a true test of uh, lectureship, uh, to see if people are good storytellers. Uh, I was uh, saying that you know faculty can bring their children in. If their children can understand, then it's really good presentation, right? Now, if you are successful, I'm going to uh, suggest to extend this exercise to students. Okay, so maybe in the next semester, we are going to select a bunch of PG students uh, who are doing research to give you the same thing in order for you to learn what's going on around here. So uh, let's see. Now, the order, it, it's kind of hard to see. We have nine faculty members, five minutes each, um, they are posted from left to right. Oh, oh, they are, oh, sorry, not in the picture order, but in this order. Okay, so people, uh, faculty, please remember where you are, and we are going to, uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, the MC here, so I'm going to turn off the light. Actually, the, uh, where's Lily? Yeah. Lily, yeah, so, so the, um, the uh, computer will, will turn off automatically, right? I'm sorry? Oh, so, so some bell will sound, okay? And, <laughs> and whoever, whoever in the middle of your talk, you have to stop. Okay, so let's welcome Professor Feng Zhen Lin. Okay, here we go. Oh, someone just, you know, to turn the slide on for me. Right, and uh, there you have my name. All right, so I'm in AI, and so you can see here, you know, so I'm interested in quite a few things. And broadly speaking, I'm interested in what we call logic-based AI. And specifically, so um, you can see here, these are some of the things I'm working on. And so one is an old topic, answer set programming. And this is actually a constraint-based uh, programming solving paradigm. And the unique thing is that we use what we call the non monotonic logic program. And this has a lot of uh, applications. Uh, people have been using this in you know, product design, in bioinformatics, and even in robotics. And I'm also interested in what we call the high-level robot design. And we actually have some you know, the language we call Golog and Kangolog, which can and program a robot and at a high level. And you can see that how the robot is going to work. Okay. And, um, what, and some other interesting things for me, game theory and social choice theory. And I have a model of you know, what the Hong Kong Legislative Council GC election is supposed to be. 
and we are actually trying to implement our algorithm for the next Hong Kong, you know, LCGC election, and maybe we can make it into some good use. And I also done some, you know, computer aided theory discovery in game theory. Oh, I didn't turn that. Right, and actually, you know, one of the theorems we di discovered and uh, using the help of a computer and got published in a very prestigious game theory journal. Right, so that's, uh, you know, something we didn't expect it. And I'm also interested in, like, uh, you know, prisoner's dilemma. If you keep on playing it, what's going to happen? And there's a lot of stories about it. And if you're interested in any of these, you're welcome to come and talk to me. But today, I'm going to talk about a bit more about um, computer program and how you can look at a computer program as agents. And you know, agent need to have you know sensing, action, and then thinking part. And in the heart of the agent, that's the thinking part, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so computer program, the agent, and the heart of it will be a KB, and this KB is going to be some logical theories. All right, and so of course there's a lot of motivation for doing, you know, computer, for, I mean, program formalization. And, uh, you know, programs are some of the most complex man-made system, right? And so as I mentioned, so to understand these systems, so we're going to treat them as agent, right? So nowadays we have this, you know, the, um, you know the big data, and we're, you know, trying to mine, you know, what, um, what, what the people, people's behaviors are. You know, maybe, you know, sometime in the future, we're not looking at the big data about the people, but big data about how the program, computer program will behave. Okay. Right, so the, as a first step, and we're not gonna construct a translator from the typical programming languages like C or even Java, and translate that into first order logic. So just a couple of examples, all right? So here's some very simple, you know, the statement. And then you can say, well, I want to introduce some variable x and y to denote the value of this program variable. And I'm interested in the input and output relation. Okay, and you can see here, it's very straightforward, right? And that's the general idea, but of course, you know, that, uh, the things, what about the real program with uh, loops, with uh, pointers, with concurrencies, right? And uh, as it turns out, loops are easy, okay, no problem. You can look at this while, well, I mean, and uh, while loop, okay. And so again, we say we use m prime to denote value of, you know, m up the end of, okay. Yes, well, that's it, okay, thank you. talk is about the fast data systems on modern computers. Like um, a, few, a week ago, my department head asked me to uh, prepare a few slides for general audience. Then I prepared a few slides and my department said, no, this is not for general audience. So then I got this task, so I said, okay, I can use the slides for CS audience. But then before we entered, my department head said, now your, your talk should be accessible to your children. I thought about it, maybe one thing my children would like, that's animations. So I prom promise you there are other animations. Um, in computer science, we have people who work on theory, who work on uh, systems, and those very smart people who work on both. Um, I am more on the system side. And then <coughs> um, my area is in database systems. Most of the students, you have learned a SQL, you know how to handle relational database systems. But for database uh, system research, most of it is out of the box, out of the SQL engines. 
So I generally we generally call them data systems. And then for data systems, um, many people work on smart algorithms. Um, I'm more interested in working on uh, commodity hardware to, to create or develop intimate algorithms that can take advantage of uh, hardware features in uh, uh, everyday platforms. Now for data space people, um, the current hot term is big data. And there are a lot of big data in business, Huawei are interested or some other companies are interested. Now um, most recently, I am interested in big data in sciences. Why so? So for example, in genomics, there are a lot of uh, data for, from individual people, from individual plants, from individual mice or other animals. So they go to uh, megabytes to gigabytes. Moreover, this sample in digital form cannot be um, accessed in the, in, in the whole. So they are going to come with fragments. And these fragments will be tenfold or hundred folds to make sure of coverage. Finally, to put the data into, into um, usage, people will um, perform tests. So these tests will involve different folds again of the data volume, will evolve over time, will be compared over number of, uh, large number of individuals. So then you can look at how much data we have in genomics. And the other example is observational astronomy. So these are about the stars, like one of the big Big uh, telescopes now is currently being built at um, Chile, out of the uh, top mountains. They have 30 terabytes, or uh, at least 15 terabytes per night. And then the um, Chinese also, of course, we have smaller ground-based uh, cameras, but they will have hundreds of them. Then you got also 10 terabytes per night, every night. And we want to detect um, um, superstars, let's say supernova, what it's called, or um, <coughs> the other alerts within few seconds. So these are the real-time uh, speed requirement. As for the genomics, people also know you, you can, current uh, sequencing machines can get data within an hour, but the analysis will take days. So my interest is how to make this process fast. Okay, so um, hopefully the quantity change, the speed change can enable change in the quality. So I'll give two examples. One is on the genomic data. Um, the, the, so I'll show you how this process goes. Uh, typically, we have fragments from sequencing machines. We need to put them in together, called assembly. So we develop some software called a G-assembler that can utilize GPU um, hardware to speed, speed out the processing. And so this kind of a sequence can be put into reference databases. Now, on the other hand, um, fragments will be aligned to the reference to look at how you match. And then we can look at how these differences appear in the references. Finally, the differences can be computed across thousands of individuals. So this all can be accelerated by the GPU. So the other project is on the astronomy. Okay, so I'll do this. So astronomy data, one thing is to do the object extraction. Give you the image, how do you extract the millions of objects from the image? Second is about this cross match. Giving you two images taken, taken two, two seconds apart, how you compare what's new, what's changed. Finally, you can also do this match uh, through image subtraction instead of putting them into databases. So again, we can use parallel processors or GPUs or parallel and distributed systems to accelerate this process. Okay. Uh, so in the end, I hope to convince you that big data in sciences can be sped up uh, using um, uh, modern hardware in available in commodity systems. Thank you.
Okay, so the title of my talk is uh, Making Sense of uh, Big Data with Visualization. So if you look at uh, this, I mean the Department of Big Data Platform Visualization in the top layer. So the interface between data and human. So provide uh, some intuitive way that people understand what in the big data. So what we do is we turn data into something like this. If you can turn data into something like this, you feel it's just like artists, right? Actually, it's indeed, we feel we are artists in the big data area. Okay, so next I just use three examples to illustrate what they have done. First is called the Urban Waste. So this is uh, some uh, website. If you go here, there is a very nice poster done by my student Wen Chao and Yi Xian. So it documents all our work on this topic. So you see, we deal with all kinds of data collected from urban environment like uh, air pollution data, taxi data, mobile phone data, subway data, and also what the human say about the urban environment. Then we turn into zero where you can find a lot of interesting patterns, like human mobility, like sentiment. So this is uh, one project we heavily work on. So this is the second is our award-winning project. It's called uh, VizMOOC. It's covered by the local medium. So what we do in all this education are quite different maybe after one or two years. So in the future, we will use this called the MOOC, right? So the instructor basically recorded the video, put online, then the student watch the video, and then in classroom, we just do group discussion. So we develop a video analytic system can let the instructor know, for example, for an instructor video, then which part is boring, student skip, which part is more interesting, student watch multiple times, or which part is more difficult. If student post something on the forum, so you are happy with your course or not happy. And for example, in the social network, right? So whether it's just a good student interact with good student or the student in the US interact with student with the US. And also we basically, for all this click stream, we know which country, for example, which country click which part of the video. So if some other kind of visualization is available, can let the instructor basically design better, I mean, the course content. So this is another I mean, project we have done. It's also covered by local media. It's called uh, Memorial TV. So for old people, they often forget something. They often want to go to old days, right? If you're born in 1960, you remember a lot of things in 1980 or something like that. So this is done by my Anfield student, a student from civil engineering department, and two students from China Academy of Arts. It's actu actually executed in the, in the library. So this is covered in the local media. This is covered by a local TV. And this is we invite some elderly people play with our I mean, the devices. And also this is President Tony play with the de uh, these devices. So the special thing about it is the interface. It's not a computer, right? Old people don't know computer. They know old-fashioned TV. You rotate the knob, then something come out, right? So it's very interesting and the interface. So this led to our, uh, this is our next, I mean, next big initiative called HCI. Many students may not know, we already have a HCI group. If you go to my webpage, you'll find we already have a website there. And uh, this is a, a nice poster done by my student, Qin. So what we do is we talk about what is HCI and what is the research activity. And we also have a lot of I mean, exciting project like HCI for robotics, HCI for smart city, HCI for e-learning, and HCI for healthcare. To summarize, the visualization is a quite cool research. So it's first uh, interdisciplinary. So we need uh, data mining to handle the big data, need a computer graphics to turn the data into viral form, and need a human computer interaction to interact with the system. And also have a strong art component. If you really want to generate some beautiful image, and then this, this visualization definitely for you. And third one, they have a lot of important application, right? For e-learning, for urban informatics, for social network, and uh, healthcare. So this is basically my talk. OK, thank you. OK, so we're just going to give you a, a quick sound bite of our research in the emotional characteristics of musical instruments. So it's a work that I've been carrying out with my PG students, including G. There's G busy at work at the piano. So anyway, our goal is to try to determine the relationship between music emotion and sound colors. So it's a little bit like sort of, there's a famous group of paintings by Monet where he sat down in front of this cathedral and he painted it at different times of the day with different colors. And 
if, at, if it was at night, then the colors were very dark and it was very mystical and, and eerie even sometimes. And sometimes it would be during the day and it would be very magical and majestic. So anyway, the emotional color was definitely influenced by the color that he was using. And it's the same idea with sound. If you've got different instruments, then you can get a different emotional characteristic. So in the research I'll show today, a, a little excerpt of what we're doing, is the piano and how the sound changes uh, with different colors. OK, whoops, down. So in all of this stuff, we do a lot of human uh, listening tests. So in our universe here, we've got piano tones, low tones, high tones, loud tones, soft tones. So here's a low one and a high one. Beep, beep. OK, so anyway, that's our universe. Eight pitches, C1 to C8. Three dynamic levels, loud, medium, and soft. And we're going to use 10 emotional categories that cor correspond to the things that composers will often want the, composer, the performer to do. Oh, play it heroically or comically, happily, romantically, mysteriously. So those are our categories. And then we asked the listeners when we compare the tones pairwise, OK, here's tone one, here's tone two. Which one sounds more happy or which one sounds more comic? OK, and after we get done with rather long, painful tests, um, anyway, this is the results for comic. We've got our, our, our different pitches, C1 to C8. There they are. And then our different dynamic levels, loud, medium, and soft. Well, in this graph, here's the maximum, C5, loud tone. And well, the 20 says that this tone was significantly more comic than 20 of the other tones. There was 23 other possible tones, so that's almost all of them. And so what the graph tells you is that, oh, OK, the piano in the middle, slightly higher register, it's the most comic, especially for loud tones. And well, oh, here's all the other different categories we tried. Many of them are quite intuitive. For example, angry, low register and loud. And then scary, the extreme registers, low and very high. And then, of course, sad. Soft and low, and shy was very strong for soft and high, just like calm and romantic. And of course, the most mysterious part of the piano, the, the high soft notes the piano, or the misterioso. It, here's a, the most interesting one, in a way. Happy was dynamic, somewhat independent. Okay, It really didn't matter, loud, medium, and soft. It was about the same. Okay, Now, once we've got a graph like that, it's really wonderful for lots of different applications. If you're a composer learning orchestration or you're trying to score your melody, it can make a big difference in the emotional characteristics you want to emphasize in which register and range. If you're a performer, this also gives you an idea which notes to emphasize and how. If you're a recording engineer, how should you set the balance between the different mics, the different instruments? And if you're a computer scientist and you're doing music emotion recognition or recommendation, this will give you a set of graphs that you could use for your system, if you've got a score for the piano, to say, oh, OK, given this input, then, oh, we can expect that it's going to be mysterious or calm or whatever. And this may not be the only characteristic, but this in combination with your melody, your harmony, your rhythm, your tempo, can tell you a lot about the emotional characteristics of the sound. Anyway, so G did a really wonderful little short thing. Beep. sort of comic little thing, because we can tell it's in the middle high register, flight of the bumblebee. And so he changed, what he did was he segmented a lot of different recordings, put them together very seamlessly. To make it sometimes a little sinister, sometimes a little comic, sometimes a little lighthearted, a little bit like the Monet, where you see it in a lot of different angles. So it was a really wonderful little combination thing. And
Okay, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm quite confused what, whether this is lightning talk or lightning talk or flashy talk. I guess it must be lightning because I only have five minutes. must be flashy too because I only have five minutes. So I'm going to talk about computational geometry in the flash. <laughs> so this is what I have been doing recently, uh, plane to point location and all that. Um, it's probably hard to explain to all of you what I usually do, but I guess in two bullet points, those two things uh, basically summarizes what my students usually work with me on. Uh, we prove fields. Um, basically, we have to de design algorithms. At the same time, we have to bound the performance of the algorithms. We have to work on the space bound. We have to work on the running time bound or sometimes curry bound. Uh, so quite often, we actually work on pencils and papers. But in the end, actually, all except one of my former PhD students, most of them in the end actually write some programs to co corroborate some of their own theorems too. So we, we do implement something, but not all the time. But uh, proofing bounds is actually one of the most important tasks that we face in our research. And therefore, mathematical maturity and skills are actually uh, very important. So in the rest of the time, let me just pick three examples so that to give you some flavor of what I work on recently. <coughs> so the first one, uh, let's say if you are given a map, a digital map, and then I just input a random coordinates and then ask you the question, which state am I, in, am I in? So do you under, do you naturally know which state that is? I don't know either. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there is a standard solution. If you go to the uh, go to the algorithm book, there's a standard solution uh, that takes linear space and gives you uh, all the log n time, which you would expect from any binary balance search tree if you have a dictionary. Now the question is, how can you do it for a two-dimensional map instead of one-dimensional numbers? And more importantly, what I'm more interested in, what if the access frequencies is unbalanced? Some states are more popularly accessed than others, like probably on the two coasts. Some states you've never even heard of, like uh, Nebraska. So therefore, there is a difference, high difference in access frequencies. So the usual binary search tree that you often work with, AVL tree, WebLab tree, if you try to use it in this setting, it doesn't work as well. And therefore, how do you actually adjust those structures? In this case, on a two-dimensional problem. So this is something that I work on recently with my students. Um, another thing is uh, shape matching. Um, this is actually uh, motivated by, uh, by a practical problem. You have two big protein molecules. How can you dock them together? How do you actually put them together? And then the certain turns out that there are a number of feature points on those two molecules, and you try to match as many feature points as possible. You try to bring the two molecules together so that those interested feature points, as many of them will come close to each other as possible. Now, at first sight, you, it's not even clear that you can solve this problem exactly. Actually, it was not known until a few years ago you can actually solve it exactly in point number time. Because there are so many different subsets of feature points that you can put into contact. If you just do it by brute force, it will take you exponential time. You will never get to finish. It turns out that you can actually do it uh, uh, quickly in polynomial time, but just that the polynomial is too high. So, so recently, my student and I, we actually looked at some approximation algorithms to try to bring, try to approximate how, how what we are talking about, bring things close together. And some of it, the 2D actually, the 2D result is quite, quite practical, we believe, so we're probably going to implement it. But the 3D result is still only theoretically interesting. We are still looking for a, another breakthrough before we can actually try to think about how to implement it. The last thing that, we, that I want to talk about is um, <coughs> this uh, shortest path. So if you are interested in trying to navigate on any terrain, there's a common phenomenon that quite often is not just the distance. Quite often when you travel in a certain direction, there will be external forces that will affect your coast, like wind, like gravity. Um, so what we have been doing recently is that we actually just go beyond distances. For example, what if we constrain your direction? You only go down. What if your travel course actually depends on the travel direction? What if you want to take a combination of the distance as well as the potential energy you actually put in onto your distance? So let me just stop here. Yeah.
Can you hear me? Yeah. So the I, I don't know this. Yeah. well, the um, ultimate uh, goal of computer vision is to make computers see things like human being. Well, everybody can recognize that there is a, uh, a human uh, and a motorcycle. Computationally, it is basically a sliding window problem. So we have to test all the possible locations, scales, and aspect ratio. So it is easily the something like, uh, well, it's still polynomial, but easily n to power 5 or n to power 6. How can we make our computer see things uh, much faster? So basically, like, uh, uh, we want to fix a certain thing. So among the location, scales, and aspect ratio, what can be fixed? As much as, I mean, like you are, uh, are, are playing with the Instagram, so what if all the rectangles that we are going to test turns out to be squares? Like, can we still recognize what is inside? Another example, and yet another example. So turns out if we only test uh, squares, then we fix the aspect ratio, we only can, I mean, even like test, we don't have to test like a wide range of uh, aspect ratio uh, uh, scales. We can only test what we call some uh, landmark uh, scales. Well, not all, the, uh, not all the squares can be used. Like uh, we are interested in what we call uh, compact uh, square object uh, 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 image which is actually given by uh, a, a tight bounding box of the object, of the target objects that we want to recognize. And the uh, CSO image is basically defined as the largest uh, square. So we have like uh, more than one uh, uh, CSO. Well, we human being can actually recognize a car, like uh, even a given square image. How about a computer? Turns out, well, uh, when uh, 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 comparing comparison with the uh, when we are given a whole image or the I mean square image, I mean human can do something between what, 95 to 97 percent. I mean the difference is not that big. And a computer for state of the art uh, uh, recognition convolution neural network. I mean the uh, well, I mean uh, the recognition accuracy is not as high as human being. But uh, turns out it's not that bad at all. Something achieving something like uh, 85 to 87. So based on this idea, so this is like uh, one of one of my ICCV uh, papers. I mean, some of my favorite papers has been rejected, so I have to talk about this one. Um, uh, turns, uh, well, basically, we we uh, we train uh, 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 we use a CSO uh, compact uh, square image or uh, object images uh, uh, to uh, do the training. Uh, and for the scales, uh, well, uh, we don't have to test uh, a lot of scales. Like, uh, for example, I mean, we basically use some sort of simple binary search where uh, uh, we can define a distance metric that is like the small, uh, the small scale and the large scale. If we can come up with a measure where the information content is basically the same, then we can just, hey, uh, we skip it. So basically, we, we test only a few uh, landmark uh, scales, so as to say. Uh, and finally, everything else turns out to be uh, engineering. Like for example, uh, um, uh, we uh, uh, this cat uh, we want to uh, localize the cat, and uh, well, uh, we basically uh, localize uh, squares. And uh, uh, turns out, well, uh, uh, like like uh, if you are really writing the program and you use our square object uh, localizer, and if you shift by one or two pixels, then probably instead of getting the second image, you are going to get your third image. So therefore, we have to implement something like uh, non-maximal suppression so that we can uh, precisely output uh, the square, uh, the, the rectangle by concatenating the output or the response of this uh, square object detector. So basically, we have uh, uh, some uh, result tests on the VOC 2007 and 2012 uh, data set and uh, some funding uh, uh, that we much uh, uh, more precise than uh, previous work. Thank you.
So uh, thanks for CK mentioned that like, human is much better than computer in some cases. So my research field is special cross sourcing. Uh, you know, have a QR code. So if you have uh, cameras, you have your phones, you can scan it. So before I start, I give a short video. <laughs> So it's actually from my group. Uh, they indeed develop. Uh, uh, let you know what is special cross housing. So basically, he is hungry. He wants to have the lunch, but he is lazy to check around the menus. He can just send a message to the people around the. And then this girl also from my group uh, got a message and does not need to know him. He can just go there and then take a picture and send to the people who really request this information. So it's like location based uh, question answering, but you know, with so many applications. Application needs. Okay, so demo is available online, so you can easily get it. So here's the framework. So we ask the people to post questions online with your mobile phones, Android or iPhone. And of course, and the people around the area, we receive the information and want to help the people. And we call it a job location based crowdsourcing. And in other words, people help people, right? So what's new here? And she like, uh, you know, like think about this, they seem like a very simple task. Of course, it's not really, I mean, that simple. The, the demo got 2014 LDB demonstration best award, and also my PhD student because of this and got uh, you know, Microsoft Research, Research Fellowship. Now he's a associate professor in Beihang. Now, let's see. How about people? You ask people to do something. Now, previously we asked what? Computer do something. What we need to do, give just electricity. Now we ask people working on it. So, uh, other the you know motivation is that people do it no out of without any I mean motivation not the motivation without any pay they are just doing it for you know for reputation the other thing like uh, you know we can use the money but once you mo use money to driven the people to work on it be careful because people are greedy and then how you can design your incentive to motivate the people to work on this this is one of the research challenges right how about second. I mean, say, ask people to take a photo for you, you know. You cannot ask people really far away from it. So you want to ask people who are near to it. So, you know, we, we have a lot of <coughs> questions about nearest near neighbor, reverse nearest neighbor, special scale, anything. But the problem is like how you can know these people is the expertise in these areas. Well, we have some papers working on this, and then how to get right people to answer the right questions. Because you cannot ask people who are not in the areas say like, okay, take a photo for Hong Kong USC, but they are in Causeway Bay, right? So this is the questions. The third, que the last question is about quality. So the people have different camera phones, you know, have a different, you know, you ask them to take a picture, so maybe they just get a picture from the web sent to you. How can you know, right? How can you know the majority may not be the correct answers? So how can you find the truth? Because usually people using crowdsourcing is the people don't know the real answer. If they know the real answer, they will not ask questions, right? So finally, our team is building the crowdsourcing software. It's not only you know, just for our own use. We want to make a first open source crowdsourcing platform. So if you are interested, uh, scan the barcode and then see like what we, we are doing there. Join us, thank you very much. Okay, let me take my own medicine. Okay, so my topic is transfer learning in big data. So let me start by uh, reminding you of our uh, uh, brain, uh, our mind father, uh, Turing. Uh, his central question was, can machines think? Okay, and he designed the Turing test in order to test this. Uh, to answer this question, um, you know, it inspired uh, uh, people from all across um, um, 
across different walks of life uh, for more than 60 years um, uh, to do research in this. And so what have they achieved? So if you look at 1960s, people thought that intelligence came from logic deduction uh, only. So Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, these are founding fathers of AI. They built a system called lo lo logic theorist, a general problem solver, and so on. And their systems uh, can do chess uh, to some extent, but not uh, at the international level. Um, at the same time, uh, robotics uh, researchers uh, um, believe that intelligence can be without representation. Uh, in particular, they believe intelligence came from instinct, like insects. So they build this into robotic systems, like uh, today you can, you can see uh, some results like the Boston Dynamics Big Dog, uh, the Google Big Dog, and systems that function on Mars. So there's a lot of achievement. And then um, in the 1980s, IBM built a parallel computer that was able to beat the uh, world champion Kasparov in chess. And, and so they believe that intelligence came from really powerful computing. And then came big data. Um, so still IBM, uh, and they built a, a knowledge base that can um, um, compete with human on TV and beat the human uh, champions. Uh, so big data, okay? In fact, um, today, uh, with the achievement of Google and, and all sorts of uh, uh, interesting uh, learning uh, technology, people finally realize that intelligence can come from big data and machine learning algorithms. Uh, here are some pictures of deep learning and uh, convolutional deep learning systems. Okay, um, but still that cannot explain the, f the full uh, extent of intelligence. Um, one thing about intelligence is that we humans learn through only a few examples instead of tens of millions of examples. Like how kids learn, how we learn to recognize uh, characters, and how, how we learn languages, okay? We can um, take a few examples by the teacher and then we extend, we, uh, so what is the essence of human intelligence then? There are many aspects, but one important thing is what we call transfer learning. Okay, so for example, um, what we learn uh, when we play chess when we were um, children, uh, we can apply that knowledge implicitly when we deal with business uh, partners. And, and so we transfer the knowledge about chess to when we're dealing with people. Okay, so this ability of extending our knowledge from domain to domain seems to be a very important part of intelligence, and this is the research we are working in. So one of the things we can do is to teach a computer to read some text, and then computers can transfer that textual knowledge into something for recognizing pictures. And so with this, we can answer questions such as, you know, how many uh, words is in a picture? We know the saying is a thousand words, right? So it turns out to be about right, okay? Now, so if we extend that further, we can see that we can continuously transfer from one domain to the next to the next, and our performance should continuously increasing. And our um, examples we need, uh, that is the cost, should decrease. And this is known as lifelong machine learning. So it's built on the building block of transfer learning through many, many domains along time. Okay. So these uh, technologies have been used by Baidu to uh, extend from vertical search to vertical search domains. And by Tencent, uh, from their social network to other social networks. So that translates to a lot of revenue. In Huawei, they have used this for database integration. So giving you multiple databases, uh, we see that once the databases are integrated, you can build much better analytical system. And uh, with that, we are investigating how to understand uh, how much overlap there is between two data sets, how to build, um, how to use deep learning as, as a vehicle for transfer learning, and how to automatically 
extract features and build different levels of features as we go along. And the feature number can be as big as 10 billion features. Okay, so with that, we can turn Turing test into something we ask, can machines transfer as a new test called the transfer learning test, the, the lifelong learning test. Thank you. Okay, so now we uh, have finished with today, so uh, thank all the speakers, but before that, we want to give students a chance to ask questions. Um, and we have 10 minutes to do that. If you want to ask a particular professor a question, please say the professor's name, and, uh, and then that professor will come up and answer the questions. Okay, any questions? Maybe uh, I can start asking Professor Luo a question. <laughs> so, so your system um, is uh, focused on improving the efficiency of um, a very large scale uh, data processing. Do you require the data to be specifically graph based? Right, so um, we look at uh, different kinds of data, like in genomics, you have sequence data, you have different uh, kind of uh, matrix uh, formatted results. Whereas in astronomy, we have image data, and we also have database records and other kinds of uh, data. Thank you, so I asked the first question. Who wants to ask the next one? Oh, where's, oh, okay. He must have been in the gym. He always goes to the gym. <laughs> Whenever he's not building his brain, he's building his body. <laughs> All right, uh, next one. Maybe uh, Zhongqi, you have a question, right? Okay. We are, we are doing the research and we say your, your, your visualization is really cool. Yeah. Uh, I want to know if there is a common tools for those uh, people without your research area, for, for me, like uh, in the data mining area. Yeah. Are there any easy tools for me to draw the scientific features? Yeah, I, I think this is a good question. Actually, this semester I offer a course called the Data Visualization. <laughs> it's one, one lecture is about the visualization system. There are three ways. So first, there are softwares called the Tableau. It's already, I mean, uh, five billion, I mean, market value, I mean, company. So they basically have a software can turn your data into visualization. But they don't need the coding, just like uh, how you use, I mean, uh, Word or something like that. The second one is uh, used called IBM Many Eyes. You still don't need the coding. So what you do is you load data into a server into IBM Many Eyes, follow their data format. They provide 20, 30 data visualization. You just follow their format. Then you press one key. They can give you a visualization. The third one is called the D3. Actually, the dominant, uh, this is uh, called the newspaper market or something like that. It's a JavaScript-based library, but you need to know some basic coding, JavaScript, HTML5, CSS, something like this. OK. Yes, yes, please. Okay, is there a place to get the slides? Uh, yes, we will make them available. Okay. Yes. So I have a question for Fountain about he want to use the game theory to model the Hong Kong Legislative Council stuff. So I, I, you think it's possible because you know you have the assumption that people should be rational, right? But you think that the people are rational over there? <laughs> well, yeah, it is definitely possible. And actually, we already have a paper out. And um, so maybe I can just show you the paper. Also. <laughs> okay, now you have to read the paper. 
glad I didn't ask the question. <laughs> okay. Any others? From the back, people at the back in particular. Uh, okay. How about uh, yeah, Wenya? You are at the back, so <laughs> ask a question. So serve you right for sitting at the back. Long <laughs> In the catch order. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat? Sorry. Uh, how do you like <laughs> the oh, okay, okay. So, actually, no, in the 3D reconstruction, <coughs> this is a whole pipeline from the starting to the end. Of course, there's uh, this geometrical layer, it's three dimensional, okay, it's mostly geometry and the more traditional, okay, uh, this accurate mathematics. But later on, we don't show all the things. Later on, we have this also recognition and understanding layer. For example, from the 3D, we want to recognize or understand for the buildings, from uh, vegetations, uh, grounds, and streets. So in that part, is you need really deep, deeply learn <laughs> to recognize all these things. <laughs> Pardon? Yes, yes, yeah. So I said, actually, deep learning, all this machine learning is. is of course, you are absolutely right. Actually, traditionally, if you see other papers, usually they are only what we call 2D visual cue based, or the only images. So here, because we have 3D representations, we have 3D features, visual cues, we can put all of them together into really this uh, different machine learning and the classification and the segmentation method. Indeed, yeah, very good. Great. Hey, students from France, can you ask a question? Yeah, Nido. Oh, music. Can you speak a little louder? Sure, go for it. Okay, most, so the question, Yeah, so the question is, in music emotion recognition, I think your question is uh, roughly, what do systems, what do the current systems do or how successful are they? Um, and the answer is, uh, yes, there are kind of a state-of-the-art music emotion recognition. It's a fairly young field. And the current recognition accuracy for most music is about 60%, okay, which is fairly low. And so what do they usually focus on? The two most common features that they'll focus on will be the rhythm and the tempo because those are fairly easy to extract. And okay, if you've got something kind of moving along fast, like that, that we heard, oh, you probably get an idea. Okay, it's, it could be comic, it could be happy, uh, it could be very angry too. Maybe you're not quite sure. So those, those types of things are usually what the systems will focus on. And so that it's, it's pretty good about that. There are some systems that focus on the melody and the harmony, which can also be extracted in, in other ways. What we're doing in focusing on, the, say, the pitch or uh, the dynamic level or the color of the instrument, that's fairly novel. That's a, that's a novel thing. It hasn't been incorporated yet. We hope to do it. Uh, that's what we're planning to do. Uh, our goal is to try to improve 
music and motion recognition so, so that they don't stay at a dismal 60% so they can at least achieve 70%, maybe 80, 90, uh, if we get you know really lucky or whatever. But that's our goal anyway, to try to rescue music and motion recognition from the depression of 60% uh, emotion uh, accuracy at this point, which is, is pretty bad. It's, it's a little above random, actually. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Human voice, okay. Mm. Sure, yeah, Music, musical voice is, is an instrument. It's a very expressive instrument, okay. It's kind of the opposite of the piano. The piano is kind of the black and white of musical instruments, and meaning in, in terms of uh, if you visually represent it, it's sort of like a black and white painting. Um, it's a sketch, because not because it's got black and white keys, but because in the piano, you press the note, it starts, and eventually it stops. In the human voice, you start it, and as long as you're breathing and breathing into the note, then it continues. And that increases the amount of expression that comes into the note, that comes into the color of the note. So I would say that, yes, uh, voice is something that we would like to expand into. And some of the musical instruments, like, the, say, the trumpet or the flute or the saxophone, or the clarinet, have that sort of breathing into the instrument just like you would have in a voice. And it affects the color uh, of the sound. Um, and uh, that's also part of our research, but it's more complicated than the example we saw today, which is the piano, which is in some sense a simple, simple case, a nice case to introduce people to uh, in the instrument. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely something very interesting question in the voice. Uh, it, from the beginning of the note to the end of the note, does the emotion change? If I go, uh, and, then, and the vibrato increases, the intensity increases, does the emotion change? Probably it does. Um, so lots of interesting questions. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Mm. And uh, by saying that if we even a, if we give this program an image, mm. we can automatically um, retrieve a music that could be uh, that could describe this image. Or uh, in the opposite way, that uh, if we give a music to it, can it produce an image that uh, shares the same emotion of this music? This yeah, certainly it's possible. Um, now, to do it really well, to do a good job of it, then uh, I think it would require a certain sophistication in, in, in making a very good mapping between the visual domain, the colors, and the image and the uh, musical image domain, the, the, the sound colors. And so there has been some work done, some preliminary work done. I've seen a couple of conference papers where they, oh, they tried to map. Uh, they said, oh, here's, here's an image. What color does it sound like? And then th they did some tests. And th I think that was a very good start toward th the application you mentioned. It would be wonderful to have those Monet paintings uh, and then have a sonification, have, a, have, have music, background music, that sort of represents the colors and how they would shift if you, you, know, you took the blue Monet, you know, ruined cathedral, and then you shifted it to the yellow, you know, uh, cathedral. Okay, how would the, how would you change the sound color? Okay, well, blue um, usually represents something either cool or maybe slightly eerie or dark or uh, you know, depending on what type of blue. Um, and so, okay, that could be maybe you know, it depends on how you want to interpret that blue, you know, in a jazz blues way or a classical way. You can you could decide the genre in advance. If you picked, oh, okay, cool represents, you know, the cool colors of, say, the mid-upper range of the piano, sort of like a placid lake. Okay, fine. And then, okay, yellow, bright yellow. Okay, that would probably be something, you know, some really kind of bright sound, like, say, saxophone. Soprano saxophone in particular comes to mind with a, with a bright timbre that was sort of brilliant. Uh, in quality, so yeah, I think you could you could talk about a mapping of the the brightness of the color, certainly with the brightness of the sound color 
that would be a very intuitive mapping, a mapping that would be very satisfying in, in, in that sonification. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, we can, we must have lots of questions, but people don't, are not brave enough to ask in the audience. Uh, but you have a chance to ask individually. So the subsequently, we have food outside, uh, right? We have food, right? <laughs> and drink. I'm not lying. Yeah, right. OK, so uh, these faculties will be around. And you are most welcome to mingle around and talk to students, talk to faculty, <laughs> ask individual questions. Uh, so finally, let's thank Dee and Lily for organization. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, so let's now move outside. Thank you. <laughs>